I've reinstalled the tubes and I spot checked a few of the resistors and so far they're all within spec. Uh, so now what I'm doing is working on the power cord. Here's what's left of the original. This is really really brittle and the wiring inside uh, I can see the bare wire exposed so this just had to go so I've already clipped it out. Uh, now the tricky bit is comes out here through a strain relief. I think, I think I can reuse that. And it goes through this clamp I need to loosen up. And then it goes into a mess down in there. So, uh, I can't quite see. I'll take this tube back out again so I can get a better look down in there. But I'm not sure exactly where it goes. At some point, this black insulation has to get stripped off. And two wires need to uh, go out. Uh, let's see. Well, I'm just going to look at the schematic. I assume one side goes to the transformer and one goes to the power switch. Let's see. Oh, upside down. Okay, power. Here we go. Okay, one side goes to the power switch and one side goes to the line adjust rheostat. So, I'll have to trace that out. I think that's the line adjust rheostat right there. And that center is supposed to be going to the plug, so that would be that black wire going off there to the right. Uh, for the other end of the cord, I removed the plug. It's actually cast aluminum. Very nice. That should polish up and look really, really sweet. There's the strain relief. It goes on like that, and then there are a couple screws that hold it together. Now, as for what I'm going to use for the replacement cord, well, I just dug out uh, some computer cords. I got a ton of these lying around uh, from all my old computers and equipment. I've saved them over the years. I got a thick one and a thinner one. I compared it to the original, and the thick one seems to be very, very close to the same diameter. So that's what I'm going to go with. Now, the original cord was unpolarized and not grounded. So I am not going to use this ground pin. I'll leave it on the end of the cord, but um, when I cut off this other end, I'll just cut the uh, green ground lead short and just use the white and the black. I'll route the black of the power switch, I think, and the white neutral to the, uh, the rheostat. Once I got those tubes out of the way, it became obvious where the power cord goes. Comes out right here, and the black wire goes to the rheostat, and the white wire goes to the power switch. I was going to wire mine around the other way, but I like to keep things original as possible, so I'll go with that. Boy, you can see how dangerous this wiring is. <laughs> Crispy that is, and bare wires exposed everywhere. So that has got to go. Um, I've already stripped the ends of the new wire. As you can see, it's very similar looking. I just cut the uh, the ground lead short. And I'll cut it even shorter and uh, seal off the end with some uh, oh, liquid electrical tape or something. Uh, I suppose you could ground the cabinet on this, but it wasn't originally, and I don't know what problems that might cause. So I'm just going to leave that part of it alone. I've got my new power cord wired in, hooked up the strain relief, going out through the top, and I wired the plug onto the end of it. I've also printed out the basic operating instructions here. The War Department, August 1944. Important thing is... on this page. It's what they call a safety position. Before you power this on, you should set all the controls to be in these positions. So I am going to do that. Pop the two tubes in and power this up. They made this chassis kind of nice to work on in that the power transformer sticks down kind of far and they put feet on it. So you can actually set this outside of the cabinet and rest it on the transformer and get access to and observe everything. So I'll be watching these two tubes for sure. 
Now let's see, power should be off. Short tube test, position one. Line adjustment extreme counterclockwise. A should be in one position. B should be in the one position. Filament off. Micro modes, 15,000. L80, R80. L80, R80. This R control is one thing that I'm not too wild about. Something else I'll have to ask about online. See, this L pot, it's all encapsulated in case there. But this R pot's wire wound and it's just exposed to the elements. Seems to me that something that was so ruggedized and covered in all this sealant and such to have that exposed just doesn't seem right. But uh, at any rate, save that for later. So. All right, to make sure all controls are in the safety position, check. Plug the power cord into a suitable AC outlet, check. Uh, determine type of tube, so on. The next uh, step C here is to actually put a tube in, but before I do that, I want to just turn this on to make sure that uh, nothing bad happens. Turn this on. Well, that's a good sign. I just turn my variac on, so. Power is going through my cord and there's nothing shorted out yet. Boy, I always hate doing that for the first time. Alright, tubes are aglow. So there's 83 glowing. 5Y3 is also glowing, but it's rather faint. Even though I had that 83 tested on my tube tester and kind of warmed up for a while, uh, I had it in a vertical position and now it's lying horizontal. So I am going to let this sit for a while and warm up before I try to actually test the tube with this device. I've had this running about 15 minutes and nothing bad has happened, so I think it's time to try testing a tube for my inaugural tube test I have selected a 6J6 one because I've got a few old, new old stock ones two because I have a bunch of them and if it does burn out uh, I can live with it and this tube tester supports it so it says to put the tube in and let's see well let's see what socket to put it in 6J6 goes into socket K. I got a chuck because there's actually three 7 pin sockets and I wasn't sure which one to put it into. Okay. Set selector switch A to the column indicator in A, which is position 1. And B should be in position two. So one and two. Six point three for the filament. And Sixty-nine for L and eleven for R. Say eleven for R right about there. Wow. Alright, now you're supposed to turn it on and hold down the line test. That's a good sign. Meter actually moved. And then you're supposed to rotate the line adjust to get the needle on the line adjust there. The reason you do that is that the readings on the meter are dependent on your, the actual line voltage you have it plugged into. 
And because that can vary from location to location, you need to hold this down and rotate this control and get that line test to be right on that. Alright, and it's the tube glowing. I'll wait a little while for it to warm up. Okay, that's plenty of time for this tube to warm up, so let's go through the various tests that this device can perform. First up is the short tube test. It checks for any shorts between elements inside the tube. To do that, you rotate this switch through the five positions here while watching the shorts light. It says it's normal for it to flash, but it should not stay on in any of the positions. So here he goes. Oh, there's a flash, but it didn't stay on, so keep going. And no shorts. Alright, next up is the quality test, which will tell you if it should be replaced or if it's good, but not an actual uh, numeric value. Okay, turn this control to the tube test position. Set the micro modes to 3000 and push the button. And there we go. Very good tube, as I suspected, since it's a new unused tube. Very cool. This tester seems to be doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. Now, here, measure the mutual conductance. Here's where we'll actually get a numeric value for how well this tube amplifies. All right, test for shorts. You always want to test for shorts before you do this, because if your tube does have shorts, you can actually damage the meter or other components if you try to do a conductance test with a known bad tube. All right, so now to measure transconductance or GM, you're supposed to put this dial to the magic GM position here. And set the micro most. Uh, to the appropriate range. I'm not sure what that is for this tube, but we'll find out. And push the red button again. Oh, got to use a higher range. So we're on the 6,000 micromoles range and measuring, oh, about 4,300, I guess. Uh, so, uh, to find out of what that means, you need to actually pull out a tube manual here. Got a 1954 RCA receiving tube manual. And let's see what it has to say about a 6J6. Here it is down at the bottom. There is on the next page. And and transconductance 5300 micromoles so this is exceeding that rating which is to be expected because this is a typical operating point and this is a brand new tube so it should at, at a minimum it should be that value but uh, even better is good for a new tube so very cool Okay, next up we got a gas test. This will test to see if there's any res residual uh, air molecules uh, inside this tube which would interfere with its operation. Let's set the tensiometer at GM again. Set the micro at 3000. Hold down the gas and try to do this one handed. So to hold this down and adjust this control to get this at a thousand I believe. And then while holding down gas one you hold down gas two and see how much the needle moves. If it moves more than one tick you've got too much gas in your tube. And this needle just barely moves so that's cool. Now, last two things. We got the noise test. To do that, you actually have to plug some banana plugs into here and run leads 
over to the antenna and ground terminals of a radio receiver. I'm not going to do that right now. I don't have a radio set up. And this last part is for checking eye tubes. Um, I don't have one handy right now, so I'll skip that. But, uh, anyways, the main test I just went through, which is the shorts, the good bad, the micro modes, and the gas test. And this device seems to be functioning properly. So, next up, I'm going to do something a little more interesting, which is what I actually got this for. Yeah, I've got a Hickok Cardmatic tube tester that will. Um, came with a set of cards for tubes that were commonly used in the late 40s and 50s and TVs. In fact, I have a card that covers every single tube in every one of my TVs. So that's the tube tester I use for that, for post-war tubes in other words. But I do not have any cards or any means of testing accurately pre-war tubes, which is why I really wanted to get one of these. So between this device and that, I can measure the transconductance, the, the, the really high quality readings for all the tubes I encounter in any of my projects. Uh, so what I want to pull out now is an actual oldie pre-war tube. So I got a couple 24s here. This is an older style, a Radiotron UI224A, the Globe style, and here's a somewhat newer uh, Raytheon 24A. I'll test the newer one first. I know both of these are okay because I've used them in radios, but I want to see what this meter has to say about it. So here's the card for it. Very different settings. And that's why when you're going from one tube to another, you don't want to just pull this out and pop the new one in before you change all these settings because these are very different. 2.5 filament for one thing, so I would have just blown this tube if I had stuck it in with it turned on. A should be 7, B should be 6, it should be 42, and this should be 10. Alrighty. So, these older tubes, they have these 4, 5, 6, and so on pin bases. Newer tubes have octal and seven pin bases so it goes in like this and it's got the grid button on top one thing I don't like about this meter is this this uh, this cap clip I don't know if this is original or not but it's really hard to open up and it's not really easy to get on uh, the only way I've found to do it well, is to kind of come down at an angle like that <laughs> My other Hickok has a much nicer cap uh, clip, so I might be replacing this guy. Anyways, uh, put this back in the one position, very important, and put it on. Alright, take the filament glowing already. It's kind of faint in these older tubes. There it is. Pause the camera while I wait for it to warm up. <laughs> 